In the time after the United States got its freedom from the British, views on slaves, slave import, and trade started to change. The slavery movement started about a century before President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation in Maryland and Delaware. In 1808, Congress made the import of slaves illegal, and by 1811, British Parliament followed suit and ended slave imports to the colonies. Even though the import of new slaves to the United States had ended, slave trade among the states was still legal except in Delaware. The punishment for kidnapping free men and slaves in Delaware set in 1793 was 39 good lashes, an hour in the pillory with both ears nailed to the pillory, and after the hour the soft portion of both ears were cut off. The value of a good slave could be up to $1,000 per head on average. Because the value, there were some who thought the risk was worth it. This included Patty Cannon and Joe Johnson. Hi guys, welcome to another adventure with Holly's Exploration and Urban Legends. Today we are on the trail of Patty Cannon. Uh, she is considered one of our nation's first serial killers and she's also part of the Reverse Underground Railroad. So, right now we are at Woodland Ferry Park, which is in Woodland, Delaware. And this is the home of the Cannons, which Patty was related to. Her husband was second cousin once removed from the Woodland Cannons. So, let's go around and check it out. See what we got here. The ferry, it used to be called Cannons Ferry. But it's now Woodland Ferry. It was established in 1740. Just five miles west of Seaford, Delaware, is a small town called Woodland, which is nestled beside the Nanticoke River. In the 1740s, James Cannon settled here and started Cannon's Ferry, which is now called Woodland Ferry. After his death, about 1793, his wife Elizabeth Cannon and son Isaac Cannon were granted privilege to operate the ferry. Isaac is said to have had two brothers, Jacob and Jesse. Jacob and Isaac Cannon were large landowners and were known to be cruel to any tenants that had a hard time paying the rent. If rent could not be paid for any reason, they would take any and all possessions the tenants had. They also made money in foreclosures and lending money interests. Because of this, Jacob and Isaac were not liked by their community. Jacob Cannon built a large house across from the ferry known as Cannon Hall. It is said that the house was built for his fiancée, and not long after the house was finished, Jacob's fiancée jilted him. One day, Jacob was shot dead in front of his house by a man known as Owen O'Day. Owen is thought to have been a former henchman of Patty Cannon. Because the brothers were not liked, there was never a murder conviction for Owen. The town thought Jacob got what he deserved. And the funny thing is, Isaac mysteriously died one month later.
Jacob, Isaac, and their mother, Elizabeth Cannon, are buried in the United Methodist Church in Woodland, across from the ferry. Another historical tragedy in Woodland is, in 1903, there was a smallpox ep epidemic and the town was quarantined. Everyone who died was buried in a mass grave somewhere by the church. The grave is unmarked. around the church and stuff is supposed to be a mass grave from a smallpox epidemic back in 1903. Um, it's unmarked so nobody knows where it is. There was no records kept. The place was quarantined so nobody knows anything. There is a lot of mystery regarding Patty Cannon. Most believe that she is not native to the Dalmarva, but no one really knows where she came from. One theory comes from an article in the Baltimore Sun dated March 31, 1907. In the article, it states that Patty Hanley came to the eastern shore of Maryland around 1802. She married Jesse Cannon and had two children. Jesse died shortly afterwards under mysterious circumstances possibly by poison, which Patty later confessed to. Another theory is her father was L.P. Hanley, son of a wealthy noble in Yorkshire, England. Mr. Hanley married a gypsy woman and was disinherited from his family and moved to Canada. While living in Canada, he had a daughter named Lucretia Patty Hanley and made a living smuggling. Lucretia is said to have married a man named Alonzo Jesse Cannon and moved to the lower Delaware, Sussex County. Yet another theory stated that Patty did come from Canada, but that Jessie met her in Buffalo, New York, where she was a dancer in a tavern. The final theory I found just stated that Patty, Martha Cannon, married Jessie Cannon about 1790. Soon after their marriage, about 1802, their criminal activity began. In regards to Jessie Cannon, Recent research shows that Patty and Jesse are related to the Woodland Cannons. Jesse was not brother to Jacob, but second cousin once removed. Some stories would have us believe that Jesse died soon after his marriage to Patty, but there are arrest documents from 1821 for Jesse, Jesse Jr., and Mary Cannon for kidnapping. Also, in 1826, Joe Johnson and his brother Ebenezer transferred to Martha Cannon, widow of Jesse Cannon, part of Wilson's Plain Dealing, which included Joe Johnson's tavern. It is believed that Jesse did not die until sometime between 1821 and 1826, which would have made him most likely included in the organized crime of his wife, Patty Cannon. Before marrying Joe Johnson, Patty's daughter, Mary, is documented to have been married to Harry Bruinton. Harry was 
convicted of kidnapping but escaped jail in 1811. Eventually, things called up to him, and in 1813, Harry was convicted of murder along with his accomplice, Joe Griffith. Both men were hanged, which made Mary a widow. Patty was now living in a small town named Johnson's Crossroads, which is now called Reliance. Johnson's Crossroads lies about four miles from Woodland Ferry and the Woodland Cannons. Her house was a few hundred feet from the Maryland line, close to the dividing line between Dorchester and Caroline counties. The house Patty lived in was built sometime in the 18th century and then torn down in 1948. When Patty's husband, Jesse, died, the sheriff sold the home to Isaac and Jacob Cannon, and Patty was the tenant. Obviously, it's been remodeled through the years, and things have been changed. And somewhere down that way is supposed to have been Patty Cannon's house. It was torn down in 1948, though, so there's nothing left. In the the Delaware line is right down, yeah, somewhere in the field over there, yes. Because the Delaware line is right down there by the church. There is a document from 1826 showing the transfer of Wilson dealing, including Joe Johnson's tavern, from Joe Johnson, son-in-law to Patty and Ebenezer Johnson, to Martha Cannon, widow of Jesse Cannon. Not long after the deed transfer, Joe left and moved south. There is a historical marker in front of the house stating that nearby stood Patty Cannon's house. The marker is on the land Joe Johnson bought in 1821 and Patty bought in 1826. The current building on the site is what is remaining of Joe Johnson's tavern. The tavern is now a private residence and has been remodeled. It doesn't have the highly gabled attic, the two fireplaces, and many other things. Across the street is an, another historical marker with a brief history of the Cannon Johnson gang and is a memorial dedicated to the victims of this evil enterprise and those who struggled against it. There is believed to be as many as 30 outlaws involved in the King Cannon Johnson gang. Patty Cannon and son-in-law Joe Johnson were the center of the gang engaged in kidnapping and selling into slavery in the South, free men and slaves. Their actions were considered by many as the reverse underground railroad. Their victims were mostly from Maryland and Delaware and Pennsylvania, with the gang being tied to murders in Philadelphia, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Dover, Georgetown, Laurel, Woodland, Easton, Cambridge, Elkton, and the Prince's Inn area. But for some reason, the gang was never tied to crimes in the secret area. The gang raided fields, cabins, and attacked travelers, which all took place before railroads in Maryland and Delaware. Joe Johnson was even known to sail a schooner from Cannon's Ferry to Baltimore to induce free men and bring them back to Patty to sell into slavery. The gang was also believed to assist in the transportation of the victims south from Woodland Ferry. All this makes sense because Woodland is only four miles away with a direct route to Reliance and most transportation was limited to waterways in the area during the time because of poor roads. Things started to catch up with Patty and her gang. Suspicions were raised by Jesse Torrey. He reported that he rescued a trio of enslaved freemen that were kidnapped in Delaware. The trio told him that they were held in a tavern dungeon until a dealer came and bought them. One of the people kidnapped was a man caught out while hunting. The other two were a mother and baby taken from their bed in their home. Tory did prove that the three were indeed free men, which started various raids on Joe Johnson's tavern. They were never able to catch Patty during those raids because she used the closeness of three jurisdictions to her advantage. The tavern, if it was raided, she would go to her home right across the line in Delaware. If her home was raided, she'd simply go to the tavern in Maryland. When Joe Johnson and Mary left in 1826, Patty moved into the tavern. 
One day, sometime in early 1829, the new tenants of her home in Delaware were plowing the field when the horse suddenly sank. The plowman started digging where the horse sank and found a blue painted chest buried. In the chest were the remains of a man, and the chest was later identified as formerly in the possession of Patty Cannon. Of course, he informed the authorities. And then an ousted member of Patty's gang, Cyrus James, told authorities that the remains in the chest were a man named Bell, a slave dealer that went missing in the area 10 years before. Cyrus said that Patty found out that the man had $15,000 on him and clubbed him from behind while he was eating dinner at the tavern. Some accounts say that Cyrus said she shot him from an outside window. James then showed the authorities where two more bodies were buried, both of whom were children. One is believed to have been a relative and the other a slave child she couldn't sell. At this point, things were finally catching up to Patty, who was now in her 60s and retired from kidnapping. In April of 1829, a good-looking Dorchester County Sheriff came to talk to Patty. He convinced her to take a walk with him and then somehow distracted her enough that they walked right over to the Delaware State Line, where a Sussex County Sheriff was waiting to arrest her. Patty Cam was indicted in the court in Georgetown, Delaware for murder but there is no records of a trial. On May 11, 1829, she was found dead in her cell. Some reports say that she took poison about three weeks before, and then others say she just died of old age. It is reported that just a few hours before her death, she did confess her sins to a priest. Patty was buried in the Georgetown jail yard. Sometime between 1902 and 1905, the bodies in the jail yard were exhumed and moved to the Potter's Field in Sussex. Three of the bodies were women. One of the people that moved what was left of the bodies got permission to keep the skull of Patty Cannon, which was later on display at the Dover Library. There are currently no records left to identify who was exhumed. The area was not very populated in the 1800s, and most people were isolated, which would have made it easier for Patty and her gang to take their kidnapped slaves up the road a few miles to the river and transport them down to the Chesapeake Bay and further south. The road between Woodland and Reliance is now called Woodland Ferry Road, which is home to another legend, the legend of Old Maggie's Bridge. Okay, and what trip through Woodland down to Reliance, Johnson's Crossroads, wouldn't be complete without stopping at Maggie's Bridge. Hal Rolf mentions in his book, The Monster's Handsome Face, about the legend of old Maggie's Bridge, but he also states that Maggie Bloxham is, her grave is somewhere in a nearby woods. So we're going to take a little trip into the woods and see if we see anything. Let's go. Maggie Bloxham was riding home one night across the bridge when something spooked her horse, going over the bridge and decapitating her and killing the baby she was carrying. The legend states that if you go to the bridge, hold your hands out and call, Maggie, I have your baby, three times she will appear to you. Legend also states that screaming and crying can be heard from the woods and from the river. Things are also supposed to happen to your vehicle like horn and lights going off without the keys in the ignition. Sometimes, even strange lights are seen.
In the book, The Monster's Handsome Face by Hal Roth, he mentions Maggie Bloxham's possible resting place. He states, A short distance below Woodland Ferry, a small tributary enters the Nanticoke from the northwest. The road to Galestown crosses this branch on Maggie's Bridge. In the woods nearby, a hidden, mostly desecrated graveyard holds generations of resting blossoms. Maggie is said to be one of them. If the old Maggie's Bridge legend is true, what could have spooked her horse causing that tragic accident? Is it possible that maybe what spooked that horse that night was a victim of Patty and her gang? Or was it something else? Okay guys, first I want to apologize for all the traffic. It is a Saturday afternoon. Um, but this concludes our trail of Patty. Patty Cannon and in the town of Reliance. Now, I want to pose a question to everybody. Do you think that perhaps Maggie's Bridge is tied into the Patty Cannon story with Maggie's Bridge being kind of in between Reliance and Woodland and Patty did take her kidnapped slaves to Cannon Ferry to transport them down the river to the Chesapeake down south? Let me know what you think in the comments. Again, thanks for watching. Tonight we're back at Woodland Ferry. 
Um, we're going to do a quick spirit box here, close to the Cannon House. We don't want to do it too close because of the people living there. We're going to skip over to the cemetery here, the graveyard, and then we're going to go. San Elizabeth. What is your name? Are you related to Patty Cannon? Going down to Maggie's Bridge since I've never done a spirit box down there and got some questions for them. Mag, I have your baby. Mag, I have your baby. Maggie, I have your baby. Maggie? Are you here? Is anybody here? Sick. The B word. Do you have something to tell me before I go? I just saw a flash over there. That way. Like, subscribe, comment, set.